One of the allures of photography, at least for me, is the doors it can open. Being a photographer has provided me access to people and communities that I might never have considered otherwise. The combination of a camera and my curiosity has gifted me with meeting fascinating people and entering their worlds. And many times, those encounters have been as special to me as the photographs I created. Chris Suspect's photography is all about that. His explorations of subcultures in the areas of music and sexuality have resulted in images that are raw and intimate. His latest book, Leather Boys, gathers images of a segment of the gay community in and around the D.C. area. The story of how he gained access and his process over the years provides some valuable information for anyone taking on a long-term personal project, regardless of the world they are hoping to explore. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Hey, man, it's good to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah, it has. I'm trying to think. I guess the last time I saw you was this past summer at Focus on the Story. Right. Well, I'm looking forward to talking to you. We met a couple of years back, and you've always been on my radar. But it's just like, as with as with so many people who I put down on my list, it sometimes takes years before I finally get them on the show. But uh, I'm glad we're finally having a chance to sit down and chat. I, I do want to remind you, though, I've heard I've been on Candid Frame before. Are you? Oh, uh, uh, on the yeah. panel. On the panel. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Not more, at Miami well, Street not, Photography Festival. Yeah. But I think about it in terms of one to one conversations. Sure. Yeah. I, I had just a taste. Now I get the full meal, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You scared me for a bit. <laughs> Am I getting that <laughs> scene <now> already? <laughs> <laughs> no, but no um, comment. No comment. <laughs> 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 well, researching your background, I, I, I found out that uh, you come from a um, a family that did a lot of traveling. Your dad was a diplomat, and you were born in the Philippines. That is that is correct. I was actually adopted in the Philippines, which okay. is uh, interesting. And I'm definitely not Filipino, so yeah, I was adopted there. My family was with the uh, the State Department, and my dad traveled to various countries around the world, all the way up through. I guess the end of uh, my college experience. So I've lived in, you know, Thailand, Denmark, Moscow, London, and then visited, you know, various countries for like a month or a week or whatever the entire time. Did you have any, any idea in terms of your birth parents at all? We, we, did any of that information get to you? So I actually, when my dad passed away a couple years ago, he left that to me, but I still haven't looked at it. Oh, why? Well, I, you know, part of it is because my parents were my parents. I felt uh, adopted or not, you know, it was just, it's just something you know, I don't, I don't know, man, you should ask my, uh, my therapist about that. Um, but I just haven't, I haven't really like, you know, I, I feel like it, I don't want to give up on the idea of my parents are my real parents because they adopted me and, and that's who cared for me. Um, you know, I'm a little scared to find out who my real parents are. What if there's life changing information there? I, you know, who knows? Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Especially the fact that it's just sitting in a letter somewhere. That's well, it's not. It's not just a letter. It's a whole packet with a bunch packet. of uh, official documents and stuff. Wow. So, so doing all this traveling, how did you sort of color your perspective in terms of when you finally came and created a life for yourself here in the in the states? Well, I have to say that uh, a little funny story about um, my first time that I remember in the United States was coming back for uh, first grade. And I could speak Danish better than I could speak English. Mm -hmm. And I was held back a grade <laughs> because my English language <laughs> skills were not that good. And then from there, I, I went to uh, Thailand, I believe. Uh, no, from there, I went to Moscow, actually. So I, I have, I think, a more of a kind of a like a world view of and I was friends with uh, people of all different kinds of cultures, classes, races, what have you. Mm. I would say it was a very wholesome upbringing in terms of um, having kind of a global perspective. 
And in your early 20s, you were part of a, of a, of a punk band. So how did music start becoming a big part of your early life? So that's another uh, funny story. Um, <laughs> I remember being in Moscow and uh, I guess the Sex Pistols had come out. And this is, I think, 1976. And I guess there was a article in the New York Times or the Washington Post because we used to get that at the embassy in Moscow. And my mom was reading about it. And she was like, Chris, you wouldn't listen to that stuff, would you? <laughs> and then on our and then on our first uh, first trip, R&R trip to uh, Helsinki, Finland, uh, we got to go to a record store. And the first album I picked up was, uh, was, was, was a Clash album, actually. I didn't want to bring home a Sex Pistols, but I'd done a little bit of kind of asking around the embassy like what are some of the other punk bands <laughs> so i picked up a clash album and a devo album and ever since then i was kind of hooked but because i was traveling you know nobody i knew played an instrument i didn't even play an instrument and it wasn't until i got to college that i met up with um some people that played uh instruments like one of my roommates played guitar he was really good he's still actually playing to get today on the on the jam band circuit and uh, anyway, so yeah, one night we're hanging out late at, late at the house and they're like, hey, play this bass. And I'm like, I don't even know what to do. They're just like, follow the dots, man. And so I just <laughs> followed what they were doing with their hands. And then I was like, you know, the hippie music is okay, but I'm really into punk rock. And then when I moved back to uh, DC after college, I met up with um, some of the former members of the band Scream. I don't know. Scream was a big Discord band. They were a, a band I really enjoyed in high school and early college. And that's the band where uh, David Grohl came from. And so this is some of the other members. Uh, one of the other members from Scream, their original drummer before Grohl was in this band. It was like, man, this guy's awesome. I get to play with him. And that's basically how I jumped into that. And how long were you into it? I played in punk bands from like 93 to 2000 and i don't know i'm still playing in my neighborhood um so I've, I've just been continuing that i still i still i still play a little bit in uh i play in a reggae a dub reggae band in my in my neighborhood but i was playing i started my own record label i put out like 20 plus cds with international dis distribution all around the world toured all over the uh, uh, the U.S. many times. So, yeah, I like to travel a lot, see new places, meet new people. Were you using a camera and did you document those times? Not at all. It wasn't until the birth of my son that I got a camera. Um, and that was because of my wife. She was like, we need to get a camera. And at that time, it was like, I don't know if we can afford it and whatever. So I got a, like a Canon power shot. Yeah. And this, this had to have been like 2006 or so. My son was born in 2005. So it was, it was a little bit after that. We were, we still, I think the iPhone, we had the iPhone camera, which is like, we need a better camera. So, and then I basically read the manual and then I went out just shooting around my neighborhood or wherever, just kind of figure out, figuring out all the settings. And that's where I figured out like what motion blur could do and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, s s shutter drag. And that was really cool. And the entire, throughout my entire like punk rock career, I was always going into the library or on the internet, you know, later in the uh, late nineties to find just kind of like raw images to use for flyers. And that's how I kind of discovered who uh, who Ouija was and Dion Arbus and stuff. And I didn't really look at them through a photographer's eye. I was looking at them more through a punk rocker's eye. I'm like going, you know, what, what are the photos that kind of excite me or that are weird, or that are different, that'll look really good on a flyer and pique people's interest. Yeah, okay. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time in the Arlington County Public Library <laughs> in their photo book section, um, just kind of going through and trying to find stuff. And yeah, and so that's kind of, so I had my, and I even bought like some photo books too, just to use for flyers. So it wasn't until I actually started working at cameras like, hey man, I could probably make photos like those guys did in those books. So how do you go from taking pictures of your son, Strummer, whose name I, I love, and um, start getting into photographing, you know, street and especially subculture? So... First things first, I got to give my wife credit. Strummer was my wife's idea for a name. So how I got from photographing the street and subcultures from that is because 
as I mentioned, this kind of like punk rock background and making flyer art and album art and things of that nature, I uh, just kind of had an had an in uh, for subcultures. I had an in into the punk rock scene and even though i hadn't played in it in a while like me going to shows or to squats or whatever you know people in the dc area know know who i am so the fact that i was bringing a a camera in was not really you know they were like oh all right you got a camera cool (laughs) and that was all i that was about it and then the street part came about because i was just kind of trying to learn how the camera functions you know i would go out and And because a lot of the stuff that I would use for flyers back in the day were kind of like, you know, protest or war or photojournalism kind of of stuff, I tried to, I was was always looking to see what the the protests were, when are the anarchists protesting, that kind of stuff. And I would like, you know, I would kind of search for that stuff and then go seek it out. I've always kind of been interested in, because I was definitely part of a subculture and I know subcultures have their own codes and ethics and rites of passage and all of that sort of stuff. It's just something I just, you know, through growing up in that scene and being familiar with what a subculture is. And within the punk world, there's a lot more subcultures. You know, there's skinhead subculture. There's the rockabilly rocker subculture. There's the mod subculture. Um, There's all these music subcultures that kind of even fall under the umbrella of punk rock, if you will. So you said that you bring or you take a sort of street photography sensibility when Mm -hmm. you're in the clubs and and these different subject matter. Explain that a a little more. And if you can give me some examples that kind of illustrate what that is for you. All right. So when I was out just kind of basically learning my camera and shooting on the, on the, on the streets, trying to kind of recreate, basically the work of, of, uh, you know, people like, like Ouija, he was the one I was most familiar with at, at that time. He's the one that I knew by name, other people that I, I knew about, but not, not really. Uh, I started posting stuff on Flickr and then I started getting a lot of people liking it. And that's kind of how I got introduced into, into street photography. Cause people were like, Oh, you're, you're a pretty good street photographer. And I'm like, what is street photography? So I started kind of researching it. And then, uh, and then I learned about like hardcore street photography, that group on, on Flickr. It's probably one of the more popular ones. And then a bunch of other groups. And they would used to have these kind of critiques where you would like submit a photo to a message thread and then some would come on and tell you basically why your photo was terrible and you'd deflate yourself and crawl back into your hole until you were brave enough to take out the camera again. But because I was really interested in, you know, why do people think these photos are good? Because I would struggle, especially with something like Alex Webb. I I was like, I don't understand why Alex Webb is considered good Mm. or, you know, just just other 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 folks. And, I, you know, I would start, I would just go out and educate myself. I'd buy their books and start reading articles and, you know, critical essays about it. Then I discovered like Aperture has this great line of kind of, uh, I don't know what they call the line. It's something like their literature, photo, lit- photo literature series or photo philosophy series where you have, you know, you know, great, great folks like Fred Rickin or um, Gary Badger. There's a whole host of uh, people that write about photography and these books have no photos in them. They're really kind of about the philosophy of of photographs, sort of like a, you know, an extension of what Roland Barthes did with the, with the camera Lucida. Um, So I would actually go and read these books in depth that had actually no, you know, very few photos in them at all, but it was really more about kind of like the psychology and the philosophy behind photography. And from that, that's how I sort of learned like the aesthetics of, you know, what, what makes a street photograph good or what makes a photo memorable or why a photo is important. And so I really applied all of that to my own practice. Yeah. And I find that, um, the, the photographs that you create when you go to these clubs and these spaces are far more intimate than a lot of the street photography is. Because even though you're photographing strangers, you're, there's a proximity that you can achieve in these venues as opposed to normally photographing a stranger on the street. And you use a wide-angle lens, you use flash in a way that might be a little more um, obtrusive on an open mm-hmm. street. 
but but talk to me about the the choices that you make in technically and why you pursue that and that that look beyond the aesthetics of what the image look lo- looks like what are you hoping to convey in the images in the uh by the way that you you choose to photograph it i want the viewer to feel like they are actually there i want them to experience it as much as i experienced it i do that by getting close getting intimate and i want like every detail of, of, because I think every detail is important in a photo um, to also be clear in, in the image. And to me, it's a way of someone to kind of like, I guess, almost forensically dissect the scene. Like, oh my God, what's this in the corner? Or what's this? Or what does this mean? Or, or look at this expression, the guy in the background or what have you. Uh, to me, that's all like important elements into what makes a, a photo, photo really great. I've shot in clubs and they were not designed for photographers in mind. So no, they can be amazingly dark. So practically speaking, I understand the use of the flash, but like you just said, some of those, some of your images are really dense. And Mm -hmm. how are you able to discern in terms of all the elements? I mean, because many, many of your photographs are not about a singular subject. Often there are other people in the frame or are there elements in the frame that are sort of, you're juggling all of them at the same time. And I, I, it's hard to imagine you being able to discern that in some of the dimmer, darker clubs that you're actually photographing in. So how do you, how do you manage that? So that goes back to what I was mentioning about, let's say, Alex Webb, for example. What makes an Alex Webb photo good? Alex Webb photos, the majority of them do not have any singular subject in them. It's all the elements in the frame that kind of bring that together. Same holds true for folks like uh, Lee Friedlander, mm-hmm. and Gary Winogrand. You know, those guys are paying attention to the edges of the frame and what they might mean. So initially, I might be attracted to, let's say, I don't know, what I would call the star of the show, or for me, what I call the anchor of the photograph. Like, this is the first thing your eye gravitates to. And then for me, unless that is something spectacular that deserves like a a portrait, (laughs) you need to balance that with something else going on in the scene to even raise it up a level. So I'm sort of... You know, kind of, even though I see something that looks amazing or awesome to me, 99% of the time, I'm like, okay, what will work with this? What else is happening in here that will make sense with this or juxtapose this or make it, you know, just crazy? So that's sort of my my approach. And yeah, you know, your eyesight is really, really good. Your camera lens is not so much, which is why I use the... uh, why, why I use the flash, but like I kind of frame it with my eye and I use an off camera flash and I have gotten very used to being able to kind of direct the light with the off camera flash to sort of highlight the regions that, that I want in addition to what I would consider the anchor or the main subject of the photograph. And I suspect that using the Leica and being able to use like hyperfocal distance or, and not having to rely on autofocus is probably a really big advantage under those circumstances. Oh man, it's, it's fast. I mean, you just go in, um, I mean, here are my, my camera settings and they're very basic. I set like ISO 400 flash full power. And then I basically just use my aperture to adjust the, the flash. So if it's something close up, I'm shooting at like F11. If I want to capture something that's like more than 12 feet away, I'm going down to like F4. Um, if I want to capture a whole big room full of people and everything in it, I go to F 2.8 or F two. So, you know, I really have managed to kind of simplify the process. So really I'm just doing the focal distance and then the aperture to adjust for light. So I'm only working with two settings, everything else I've just simplified. So and you're shooting digital for everything or are you shooting film? Uh, digital. Okay. So you I, had a, I had a, fi- I had a, I had a film phase earlier on and, uh, you know, <laughs> couple thousand dollars in one year spent on film was uh <laughs> changed my mind let's talk about your 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 new book leather boys um how did you come on uh, come on to being able to discover this this subculture and what led you to be able to photograph it 
So that's, uh, you know, that was a weird, that's sort of a weird thing. It's a, it's, it's a, so I was, um, I guess it was 2013. I was uh, just doing street photography in uh, the Chinatown area in Washington, D.C. And I saw these two guys with uh, like leather chaps on. I'm like, all right, this is kind of worthy of a photo. And instead of just focusing on those two, I wanted it to juxtapose it with something else or whatever. So I followed them. And then like, you know, five or six blocks later, um, without finding an opportunity to make a, like a good photo work, they kind of, they went into this hotel, but the, the hotel that they went into, there were people outside smoking cigarettes or hanging out. And these people were just wearing, I don't know, like leather trench coats and jock straps, or it, it was just bizarre. I was like, what the hell is going on here? So I walked into the hotel and went down the escalator and it was like, basically, and this was at like three thirty, four o'clock in the afternoon. And the whole place was just packed with, you know, people in all kinds of like just bondage outfits, all guys, there was not one female there. And I was pretty much intimidated right off the bat. I mean, I had the guts to go down the escalator and into that <laughs> throng of people, but I really, and I took maybe three or four pictures, but I was so intimidated by it. I was, it was just kind of scary, but I was like, I was like, you know what, this could be really, really interesting uh, to shoot because it was basically just, you know, I felt it, it, it just seemed, it seemed like this was a whole scene or world I knew nothing about at all. For me, it was just kind of interesting to, 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 to go explore and to see like, you know, what makes these people tick? What gets them excited? What are they into? So the following year, because this turned out to be a, a festival, this is called the Mid-Atlantic Leather Festival. I had this uh, gay friend of mine and he said, yeah, I'm into that stuff. I'm like, well, will you go with me? <laughs> will you go with me to this hotel? Will you go to me to the Leather Fest, please? I need someone to hold my hand and feel safe with. He um, agreed and brought me there and he brought his, uh, his uh, boyfriend at the time. And we just had a great time. And they were like, you know, they just had so much more insider uh, stuff into the culture that really allowed me to understand like, you know, kind of how to approach people or when it's cool to take a photo or what have you. So basically from that experience, I basically learned, uh, you know, you know, a couple things. And then um, later on, after the next year, turns out the guy that runs the whole thing is a Leica and photography enthusiast. And he goes to the uh, Leica, Leica store in DC and I met him and it was like, oh yeah, Frank runs that festival you like to shoot. And so like knowing him, like gave me even more confidence. So, you know, now, now I just feel free to go down there, you know, without any inhibitions and just, and just photograph. Now, I, you know, I have to also say that the um, environment is you know everybody in in that pl in in those areas are all you know really into their scene they're having a good time they're partying mm -hmm. they don't mind being photographed but occasionally someone may not like it and you know you just i just tell them what i'm doing i'm like hey i'm working on this project and uh, you know i'll you know i can either delete your photo or just won't use it um and they're like oh that's cool whatever and so it's it's a, it's a good example for any photographer who is an outsider in a community. The biggest obstacle has to do with you getting over your own doubts, hangups, assumptions. You know, yeah. that, that really is the that you really need to get over that. People talk a lot about getting getting access, but you can get access and still not make any interesting work because you're too you're too much in your head to be able to really see it and experience it in the way that it deserves. So how, how tell me about getting over all of those things yourself. Well, it actually, and that was extremely, extremely difficult for me. I had to jump a really big hurdle in my life because when I was uh, growing up in boarding school, I was also sexually abused. Mm -hmm. And so this was like putting myself into that environment of, you know, here are a bunch of, you know, and these, these, these guys, they're not your, like, they're not your, your 
gay folks that you think stereotypically these are people like your postman <laughs> or garbage man these are these are tough looking guys um a lot of them are not all of them but you know a good portion of them are pretty intimidating looking you know and that just gave me like flashbacks triggers to back when i was uh, abused in uh in high school so it was a big step for me to kind of um, go over that but you know once i realized you know that these people are just they're they're just having fun like any other party any other adult having fun at a cocktail party this is just how they like to dress and and what they do and yeah you have to put up with a little bit of um uh you know people will hit on you you know you just have to say i'm not interested or i have a partner or whatever and that's fine but you know you have to be able to kind of you know overcome overcome that a little bit but at the end of the day, it's almost like no different than if you went to go photograph like a fish show or something, you know, it's like yeah. it's its own culture. They have their own thing. Um, and as long as you're like open minded and not judgmental and nice and even and just being honest, you know, telling people like, hey, you know, I'm 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 not gay. I'm just here to photograph it. You know, <laughs> I mean, they're like, well, why are you interested in this? Why are you, you know, you know, you just tell them like I. I think it's really, it's awesome that you formed this whole community. This is great. And it works. You know, if, you know, one of the things I find a lot of, a lot of people have trouble who are photographers going into situations like this, they may have some, it's something in the back of their mind that may be judgmental, or this is like how, you know, they were brought up a Southern Baptist or whatever it may be. And so they, they come in with kind of a emotional baggage, if you will. And it's just, you know, you need to, you need to just let that go and just see it for what it is. I mean, it's really no different than a, than a church service. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying that, but as essentially, you know, I've been to some Southern Baptist churches, um, you know, where they speak in tongues and all of that. It's really not that much different. Yeah. I've received so many messages over the past several weeks from people thanking me for producing the show, especially during this time. It's been so good to hear that we've been able to offer you something that has been both encouraging and a welcome diversion from all the bad news that's out there. It always means so much to me to know not only that people are listening, but that I'm playing a small, positive role in their lives. I love these conversations that I have with photographers each week. And I'm so thankful that they continue to mean so much to you, even after 14 years. It's incredibly gratifying. And if you feel the same way about the Candid Frame, you can support our work here by becoming a financial contributor. Join our Patreon effort, and for as little as $5 a month, you can help us to continue providing you and many others these great conversations with great photographers. Sign up today by visiting patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame. Thanks. But you're aware going in that you know, there are certain stereotypical images of the scene. So in terms of how you photographed and what you chose to show later, how did that sort of temper how you worked? Well, the main thing I did not want to turn it into was pornography. So that was really at the top, the foremost of my mind. You know, if you notice, there's not one there's not one real uh, penis, if you will, in the book. Um, there's fake ones, but not real ones. You know, my 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 goal was to was was to kind of document the the people, the the scene, the environment, the camaraderie, the quirkiness, the weirdness, everything. But where your mind kind of takes you to immediately when you think of that, you know, to kind of just you know give it give it give a, a like a you know at the end at the end of the day people that go to that sort of thing are probably like yeah hey i'm going there to get to get laid and as a photographer like you know like oh i'm going to you know i'm i'm, I'm going to be able to, to to shoot naked people or whatever but my goal was to stay away from all of that as much as possible and really to kind of get a fuller picture or story if you will of just sort of all the 
sort of stuff that goes on. You know, I've, you know, it's, if you look at some of the images in the book, there's, you know, one I particularly like of this guy trying to get into this like latex vest that is way too tight for him. And he has two people helping him get into it. You know, it's like that to me is, is more interesting than if he was having sex, you know, that was, that was my main, main, main goal is, was to not kind of go there photographically. But it's fascinating that when, when photographers are, photographing cultures that really delve into sexual attitudes, sexual practices. It's especially, especially in the States, I really can't speak for other, other, other cultures, but it's like there is this sort of magnetic curiosity about mm -hmm. it. But there's also, I think a certain level of fear that people feel when they see these things. And I think it's an interesting tension that's that's created because you know we're raised in a culture where our sexual desires and fantasies are things that we've been taught we keep secret you know that we don't divulge on, on, unless it's with an intimate partner and then we're, when we see people both heterosexual and 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 homosexual you know are, are acting out in this way publicly or semi-publicly that it, it brings up a bunch of stuff and i'm, and I'm wondering how much of that is that one of the things that you find most fascinating about producing the work? I find it yet yeah, to be challenging for, for people to, to view. There's um, several folks uh, that have seen this that are totally turned off and get very irate about it or just make fun of it. And then, you know, there are other folks like, it's amazing that you're able to do this. You know, it's sort of a, a split a split thing, but you're right. We're brought up in this kind of Protestant culture. It's really interesting and related, but not related at all. But I was listening to a podcast the other day about perfume and that how in the United States for the past 20 years, the most popular types of perfume that sell in the United States are perfumes that are designed to make you smell like you just got out of a shower. And if you go to uh, France or other places in Europe, they prefer more funky perfumes or perfumes that create a, more of a desire. And I think that's also, that speaks to the American culture here. And so I was, uh, you know, I guess I'm on the, on the funkier side of uh, perfume, if you will, <laughs> is where I'm going with this. But um, yeah, I mean, if it challenges people, good. You know, photography is not not safe. I don't think. I mean, if, if you want to produce work that's, that's memorable, you know, it needs to, it needs to, to challenge and to, to, and to provoke. One of the um, things that I, I noticed about the, the work is it seems that that scene is largely dominated by white males. I didn't see much in the way of blacks or Latinos or, or Asians there. Is, is this a really distinctive white male subculture or, or, do the other other minorities are involved so it, in, in a completely separate? So no, there are um, there is a, a subgroup of that of African Americans that uh, participate. In fact, they have their own fashion show there. But yeah, it's not as large. Most of it is white heterosexual. I mean, not heterosexual, homosexual males, and you don't. Um, not many Hispanics, although there are a few here, here and there. Um, and there's an occasional woman who I feel sorry for because they pretty much get ostracized um, <laughs> just for being there. Yeah, so that, that, that is true. So this is uh, interesting that you may bring this up because there was another project that I've been working on called Faith, which is about these gay African-American males that are very religious. And that started around the same time. And through them, um, I've learned that there is a real um, there, there, there is a real undercurrent of uh, discrimination within the gay scene between African Americans and, and, and white white folks. In fact, one of the reasons why I pursued this leather boys things because I was trying to understand the difference between gay African-Americans and white African-Americans, because I was also at the same time photographing that community as well. And what, what did you learn as a, as, a, as a result of exploring both? When I initially got involved in this, and this is the both such random ways that I got involved, you know, basically, basically what I thought going in 
as a as a white straight male was that hey you know everything under the rainbow flag is hunky dory you know it's all peace love and what have you and then when i was you know photographing uh, the people for my faith project when i would go out I'd, I'd meet up with them at, at bars to show them the work that I did from the previous church service or party that I attended or what have you. And it, there were occasions where they would get charged twice as much for a drink than I would, or they would not be allowed in the bar for what they're wearing. And I'm like, dude, I'm wearing a tank top. What do you mean? No collars, you know, or what do you mean? You have to have a collar to come in here. How come I can come in, but he can't because he's in a t-shirt. And then also I know from those folks that, you know, like a lot on like gay dating apps, there are um, a lot of folks have no, uh, you know, they'll just put like, you know, no blacks, you know, as their preferences. So it's, it's a little bit uh, disgusting, if you, if you will. So I was kind of curious uh, about that as well. Um, but that's really not the subject of the, of the Leather Boys book. Yeah. You know, when you're, when you're, Outside, for me, when I'm outside of a culture that I'm, I'm photographing, I'm always sort of hyper aware that I am an outsider. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get it as right as I can, but I know that there's likely going to be, you know, certain things that I'm just not going to pick up on just because I'm not part of this. And as much as I make an effort to research or talk with people, I'm always worrying, is there anything that I'm missing or that is impacting the way I'm choosing it to document or do I have a, a, a bias that is not necessarily leading me to make a stereotypical image, but a bias that is leading me to miss something that's important. So uh, tell me about that sort of thought process when you're, when you're photographing these, these, these. So uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. always kind of in the back of my mind, but I also think you can't really think, uh, I mean, when you're doing the actual act of photography, I don't think that should allow any of that should allow you to get in the way of getting like a good picture or what you're what you're doing. I think that sort of thing is important when you're editing it later. Right. When you're analyzing it later, like, you know, when you have to think about is this rep, you know, is this representing these people in the uh, in a an honest way? Or is the way I shot this bringing my own baggage to the to the photo? And I think, you know, so that's a little bit of a challenge. But the more you kind of just hang out and get to know people, I have people, people in the scene are, are like actually friends of mine now. You know, I can talk to them on a weekly basis or what have you. So I, I, I feel, you know, part of that community when you do something for like seven years like that you know you 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 you, you feel you're you're sort of part and they've accepted you you feel like you're part of that community and what's the reaction then to the work well so far uh, everything's on uh pre-sales right now right so um no one's really seen the full object other than you i think at this point i've just kind of been leaking stuff out to uh, to, to to promote it but the reaction's been um really really good so in dc there's this uh website brightest young things and they're like sort of um, a, a pillar of the of the queer community here and they've been featuring it a lot this pack past week they've been promoting it like three times you know three times and it, they also reached new york city and stuff so that's been really kind of cool within uh my usual network of photographers i would say it's kind of split some people are like oh that's cool that you did that but i don't want to see it people are like uh oh i can't wait to see it um but i do get a lot of people are like oh that's that's great that you did that but uh you know you know that's not my thing i'm not interested in it <laughs> so okay <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 from what I've heard, you're trying to produce four books within a finite period of time. Um, this is one of them. That is correct. Yeah. So tell me about this. I mean, usually people are working on just trying to get one book out. You're trying to get out four. Tell me about why and what's the process that you're going through to put these out. So the reason why is I have, you know, I've been shooting for quite a long time and I've just been basically collecting images. When I started doing photography, I guess like most people, you know, you're learning about the camera. You're not really sure what you're, um, 
you know, interest are photographically. I mean, you might have ideas like I want to do this project or whatever, but it's really only over time where you get to, when you're looking at your own work and you sort of see, I guess, representations of your subculture, of your subconsciousness in print on the screen in front of you, you go like, yeah, you know, I like balloons a lot. Why do I always photograph balloons <laughs> or whatever it might be? Yeah. I, I photograph a lot of balloons. That's why I bring it up. And then I've been kind of just like messing with the stuff all along and just kind of piecing it together. And this is, you know, these all seem to work, work together. I started with the, uh, the, the, that faith project that I mentioned earlier was something that I definitely wanted to be a book. And I approached several publishers and basically everyone that I showed it to were like, yeah, we want to definitely publish this, but you need to raise the money. And I was like, you know, I'm a photographer. I'm not a fundraiser. I don't want to start a Kickstarter. I don't, I don't know the first thing about getting a grant. And I was like, you know, I, you know, you need $70,000 to make this book. You need $30,000 to make this book or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And is someone coming from the DIY punk rock scene who put out their own CDs and records? I was like, you know what? I'm going to see what it really costs to make a photo book. You know, obviously as a, as someone who's doing it off their laptop in their home, doesn't have the same, um, you know, cost as someone with a brick and mortar office and people that are hired, but you know, so there's a lot more costs with that. But I was like, you know, if I just do like limited runs, special edition things and just keep it like that and do it myself, um, I could probably, uh, pull this off. So that was sort of the, uh, the inspiration, like not, not wanting to go around and beg other photographers or friends or, you know, people that like my work to like donate money to a Kickstarter. I was like, you know what? I'd rather just go, Hey, I have this product and it's ready to go. Will yeah. you buy it? And I just felt it, it just feels better to me than going, Hey, fund this and you'll get an extra print here or whatever, you know, it's kind of, and if it doesn't make it, then I guess you get your money back. And to me, that seems a little bit deflating. I was just like, you know, I'm just going to take the risk and I'm going to, I'm going to research it and, you know, find out where to, where to print it. You know, one of the things I felt was important when I was, when I was in finding my printer was I wanted them to be in the United States. And not not because I'm a you know pro USA manufacturing guy, but I do know that shipping books and things like that from overseas costs a lot of money, and I know that from producing records and having to ship those things around the world. So it's like I'm sure there's a really good printer in the United States. They might be more than the printer in Istanbul or wherever, but you know what? Their shipping is going to be a lot cheaper. So I found a printer, the same printer that's done Richard Avedon's books, and they do the Gagosian galleries catalogs. And I was like, you know, these folks know what they're doing. Maybe more expensive than your average printer, but it's definitely not as expensive if you sign up with a publisher who, you know, wants you to raise like three times the amount of money on your own to even get it published. And then I was also thinking about people like Dido Moriyami and a lot of the Japanese photographers and the Provoke error that were constantly kind of putting out zines and work you know, sometimes 12 books in a year or what have you. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to, you know, my goal for 2020 is like, I want to put out four books in one year, you know, in the spirit of those Japanese photographers using a U.S. printer and doing it myself in the spirit of a punk rocker putting out vinyl seven inches. And um, that's kind of how it, it it's come together. And so far, it's been working out fairly well because, you know, one, the, the, you know, one book will finance the other book, et cetera. I was able to actually do a, se a second printing or second edition of my first book, which is really cool. Which was? Uh, Gratuity yeah. Included. And, tell and us that a one's bit. a little. So Gratuity Included is basically images from just basically. I would say they're basically outtakes of a lot of sort of out of the like parties or street or street photography at night, everything that used with a flash that have sort of woven into this narrative of like a, an Alice in Wonderland at night kind of thing. So it, there's definitely a photographic narrative throughout that book. It takes you from like a beginning to an end. And yeah, it, it runs the gamut, everything from images from like a, from like a, a car crash in Belgium to a, um, a fight on the streets in New Orleans to a couple breaking up in Bogota, Colombia to, uh, 
just some hijinks on in South Beach during our Basel week. And so I've kind of just kind of narr- uh, you know, woven them into a, uh, a dark story, if you will. Basically, a dark story of nightlife. <laughs> so, so because you don't work as a as a photographer. In, in fact, I pretty much uh, one of my goals with doing photography was that I did not want to do photography for profit or money or for a living. I wanted to just do it for fun or for a passion. Okay. And I basically turned down opportunities all the time to photograph someone's wedding or somebody or. Or, or be an event photographer or just chase money with photography because I found, especially with doing a record label as, as well, it's like I got into it for playing the music and I was also very interested in the design part of it in terms of album covers and flyers and all that. Um, but when it came down to counting beans and the money, it was really kind of turned me off. And then to actually have to kind of rely on that just to pay your rent or whatever, when there's much more easier ways to make money, didn't really make make sense to me. And I've learned it the hard way because everything that I've pretty much done, I've turned into a living. I mean, I was a full-time musician. I'm basically now a full-time videographer and audio producer. When I get back from work, do I want to go edit video? Not at all. I want to say, I, I want to do, I want to work on photos. So that's why I don't want to go out and shoot photos for somebody else because it's going to suck the joy out of what I like to do or what I like about photography. So I've been really adamant about that. And I, I think that's actually really paid off because I've actually been able to be true to myself, to my photographic vision, what I want to do with photography, and I'm sort of, you know, I'm in control of that. I don't have to go do something I don't want to do with photography. I only yeah, do what I want to do. That's a big advantage to that. People undervalue the ability to be able to do that. Yeah. And really, you like, you know, if all I did was photography all the time, I don't know if I would be as passionate about it, right? Yeah. If I had to do it all the time, you know, I just, I just flash back. I remember, uh, I was at, I was at look, look three was a very popular photography festival in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia for many years. And I just remember hearing a lot of uh, photojournalists talking about, yeah, I'll just go in there for an hour and take what I need to take for the magazine. And I'm like, dude, I would, I would spend the entire day shooting that just because I wanted to, not because I had to get something done. And that's yeah. kind of, when I was hearing talk like that, I was like, that's not really where I, I want to be. You know, I always want to have that passion. Like, I'm going to get there early. I'm going to stay there to the bitter end. And I'm going to get as much of this as that uh, that I need. And I think ultimately that kind of produces better work. But, you know, I also understand if that's what you got to do for money, you know, it's, it's, it's different, you know. Yeah. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to uh, recommend another photographer. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? So I know you uh, asked this question quite a bit, and I actually listened to your podcast quite quite a lot. So with that said, I came prepared. <laughs> so the other day I was on uh, Instagram and someone was like, hey, do you know the work of Charles Gatewood? And I was like, no, I don't. Do you know Charles Gatewood? No, I don't think so. So he recommended this book to me called uh, Side Tripping by Charles Gatewood. And Charles Gatewood was a photographer in the in the 70s that basically kind of photographed the the wild 70s and I guess early 80s. And he continued on until he passed away a couple of years ago. But he did this wonderful book, which is his photos with basically William S. Burroughs riffing off the photos with text. Ooh, and okay. it is really awesome. The guy who uh, suggested it to me was like, you know, your photos remind me of uh, a lot of Charles Gatewood photos. So I was like, so I instantly was like, okay, I got to check out who he's who he's talking about, and it does not disappoint at all. And how Burroughs Burroughs's text with the photos is just, it's just, it's as rough and raw as Burroughs is, oh, just yeah. as the photos are, and it is uh, just fantastic. The cover of the book is a little misleading. But once you actually get into the book and start reading the the text of Burroughs, it is a uh, it is okay. it is fantastic. It is a real uh, is a real gem. I've gone through it like three times. I just got it like three weeks ago, and I've read it like three times, oh, cover to cover. I think you're um, making me spend more money again. 
<laughs> yeah, it's really, it's it's really, really, really good. It makes me want to get someone like William S. Burroughs to to write about my photos. You know, it's just like it's it's just a really interesting interesting take on. You get a get a great genius writer to to work with great photographs and riff off the photographs. I think it's a good good recipe for something special. Cool. And um, before I let you go, you had mentioned, um, I guess Italy. Or something because I know you teach. So, or what's you, you, oh, I know a lot of things have been put on hold this year. But is there anything you want to share with us that may be coming it's, up? It's self promotion time, other than uh, <laughs> than the book, other than um, uh, Leather Boys, which is available for pre sale now at chrissuspect dot com. I will be a guest for the virtual London Street Photography Festival where I'll be doing a talk about uh, Leather Boys and I guess the, you know, the four books in a year year project. And then who knows if this will happen or not, but I do an annual workshop uh, in Mexico for Day of the Dead at San Miguel de Allende, which is awesome. And that'll be in late October, November. And then fingers crossed, we'll have another Miami Street Photography Festival and I'll be able to go down for that i'm part of the the festival so yeah cool that's okay. that's what's what's on on tap for now and hopefully those taps run freely okay. yeah i hope so too okay <laughs> thank you so much it was really fun talking with you yes this has been fantastic thank you very much thanks to chris for joining us find out more about him and his work by visiting chris suspect Com. If you want a chance to win a brand new Fujifilm X100V, submit some of the images that you've taken at home over the past weeks and months to a photo contest that I'm involved with in conjunction with Fujifilm America, DxO, and Viewbug. The theme of the contest is your world right now. Light, shapes, and moments. And just like it says, we want to see what you've created while you've been at home. Find out more by checking out the show notes or visiting the website. I look forward to seeing what you've made. If you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the show, write a review on whatever service you listen to podcasts. Those reviews have led people to take a chance on our show and allowed us to grow. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and our mailing list. On the YouTube channel, I offer critiques on images submitted by TCF listeners like you, while the mailing list keeps you updated with all TCF events, including workshops, and more. Sign up today. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal. Thanks to Ray Greeny for his recent contribution. We also provide a series of ebooks on photography available for purchase on our website. It's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge for making great photographs and another way for you to support the show. And if you have found that you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, which is available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>